Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. Evening. So what you drinking on over there, Mike? Well, I so I've made for us the White Lady cocktail. It is, um, you, are you familiar with the sidecar? I'm not. Okay, well, the sidecar is a, another classic cocktail, um, but it's, uh, it's brandy, lemon juice, and um, some kind of triple sec. I, I use Cointreau because it's the best. Um, so this is essentially the same thing, but it uses gin instead of brandy. Definitely taste the gin in this drink. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Shake it up really good. You, you want lots of bubbles. Uh-huh. It's nice and light. It's good. I like it. Like I say, I'm normally a whiskey drinker myself, but well, I, I like the occasional gin drink, I guess. I, I'm an equal opportunity drinker. There's, <laughs> and I, I try to spread it around. Fair enough. And this is one of my favorites. I yeah. Make from time to time when I buy too many lemons. Good way to dispose of the lemons. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we wanted to uh, finally, I guess, get around to talking about the Green New Deal tonight. Um, uh, Gary actually read through the thing. I'm not sure how he managed. but Yeah, I'm not really sure how I managed either. I'm not going to lie. There's a whole lot of words and not a lot of substance. Is is like to break it down, I just... it's There's just not much there. There's I'll, I'll tell you the one thing that did strike me about it. So I went in with this idea that it was going to be a lot of stuff on global warming or whatever we're calling it now. Mm -hmm. Um, Climate change, I guess. Um, And that's what I expected it to be. Anthropogenic climate change or something like that. Is is that where we're at now? At any rate, I did expect a whole lot of, of talk on climate change. And while it is heavy with that, it's equally as heavy with social justice. It's... Uh, for for as much climate change talk as there is, there's an equal amount of social justice talk, and and I wasn't really prepared for that. I, that's and maybe that's just on me for not realizing what I was getting myself into. Meaning but, what exactly? Like what? Uh, a lot of talk about. Well, let me see here. Maybe I can find the quote. Um, shouldn't be too hard. Are you talking about, I mean, like they're just, they're talking about wages and things like that? Yeah, or? I'm looking a lot. Well, yeah, a whole lot of wage stuff. There was also some um, talk about, of course, they have to throw little things to every little group. So like the unions got it. There was some talk in there about making sure we're using that as as we transition to this new economy, that, that unions play a big role in this. Mm-hmm. And um a lot of stuff like that. A lot of talk about inequality. So a lot of talk about I'm trying to think of, of, of an example, but just about which like groups. Like the gender wage gap, did, like we were talking yeah, about last week. Yeah, that that's in there. There's a lot of talk about, um, about yeah, just that type of thing. Um, and, and I wasn't prepared for that. I really expected it to be more just driven by by climate change, and it wasn't. It's It's a good mix. And I guess when you think about it, that you, if you're going to create a piece, of, this isn't legislation. I guess it's a resolution of some mm-hmm. sort. But um, you've got to throw, you got to pull everybody on board, and I that maybe that's just part of the way it works in Washington. I don't know. But. Well, I mean, they have to turn public opinion towards it. Yeah. I mean, because anybody that looks deeply is going to find that the costs are great, regardless of what they're they're yeah. saying. Out well. There. And that's the other thing. There is a lot of talk about spending money in this thing and not a lot of talk about where that money's coming from. Well, it's funny you should mention that because I read an article um, in Forbes by Robert Hockett. And the title kind of set me off right from the beginning. So I'll tell you right now that I had a – there was a biased view as I went into this. Uh, (laughs) How can there not be? I mean, look. (laughs) Well, the, the title is The Green New Deal. How we'll pay for it isn't a thing, and inflation isn't either. Yeah, I can't say I go into that with a, exactly an unbiased opinion. Yeah. Well, uh, he, you know, his proposal for how we're going to pay for it essentially is that we just create the money. Yeah. That the, you know, the U.S. government just, whatever money they need, they print and spend. 
Well, and honestly, that's that's been our monetary policy for a long time. Yes. <laughs> it has. And that's so th- when you talk about like I have some liberal friends and they're, they're a big believer in a, a big minimum wage. And, that, and their argument for that is that we need this big minimum wage because the the whatever you want to call it, the the wages haven't kept up with the times. So like. But really what the problem is, is that it's not so much that the wages haven't kept up. It's that the the money is worth less, mm-hmm. that we've, we've printed it and we've printed it and it becomes worth less and less and less. Yeah. So you fix the money problem, you can fix the minimum wage problem through that. Well, it's now I've actually I did some research into this while I was going through this article. I mean, literally while I was going through the article, <laughs> I, I was like, well, I'm, you know, checking some of these these claims. And the truth is that the, I mean, he talks about the um, consumer price index yeah. uh, a fair bit. And the the truth is that the consumer price index has increased by approximately the same amount as inflation. Um, so like $119.80 is worth $313 today, approximately. Give or take. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so the wages have increased by about three times and that period that the median wage yeah um has increased about three times in that period uh a lot of consumer goods have increased by about the same amount so uh, and i was looking at you know big consumer like big appliances refrigerators ovens things like that cars yeah. um as you know automobiles is another uh another i don't know an, another group of consumer goods um so they're the Consumer price index and inflation have increased, have gone up at about the same amount. But that's yeah. exactly what you'd expect, honestly. Yeah. Because what you're, well, at least in this kind of market, um, because what you're really saying is that the value of the good hasn't changed, but the value of the dollar has. Yeah. Well, and that that's kind of what, what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. And as, as far as like the whole idea of just going to print money, by the way, if you don't think that that's a problem... I want you to just take a look over at Venezuela and tell me that that's not a problem. Right. Because just because it's worked for this long and we've kind of gotten away with it, don't mean we can't find ourselves in that same type situation that they're dealing with. Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, corollary problems, too, with this. And and that's that it it rewards bad behavior in a lot of ways. Inflation rewards bad behavior because what it does is it strips away the savings of the people that were responsible with their money. Hmm. And it decreases the debt of the people that were irresponsible with their money. Absolutely. Um, and it creates all kinds of, of bad incentives like so many government programs do. Yeah. Uh, and government is controlling the inflation rate as best they can Yeah. Um, anyway. And, they, uh, and I think that we haven't actually seen how far it's going to go either because the money supply or – I should say the currency supply, because this is actually one of the conflations in here that we should probably clear up. I was going to say, we ought to go on and get that leveled out right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the the uh, currency supply has increased by like four or five times since the 2008 um, financial collapse. Yeah. Um, so there is four or five times as many bills in circulation. And now it's not really bills in circulation because they did it through quantitative money, easing. Money they, in the system, right? Yeah, yeah, they moved it into the stocks. So yeah. here you have, this is kind of interesting anyway. And if you don't think that the the wealthy and connected don't take advantage, if you don't think that the wealthy and connected take advantage of this, then you're just not paying attention. Yeah. But the, the way the quantitative easing works is that the um, Federal Reserve essentially creates money out of nothing. They just like add zeros into the system and then they used the money that they made to buy stock. Really? Yes. And so they buy stock um, to prop up the market and it, it drives some prices up. And so again, if you don't think that the wealthy and connected are able to take advantage of this, then you're, you know, yeah. then you have a lot more faith in humanity than I do, <laughs> I guess. That's, right. that's really what it comes down to. But um, there is a conflation here between uh, currency and money, and in fact, he says, "I actually I have to read this part because it just I, I couldn't believe what I was reading." He says, um, "Look at the dollar. The face you see. I, I left out a little bit there, but anyway, the face you see is George Washington's, a public official's, not yours or some other private sector person's. 
The signatures you'll find, for their part, are those of the treasurer and the treasury secretary, not yours or some other private sector persons. And the inscription you'll read across the top is Federal Reserve Note, not Private Sector Sally's Note. <laughs> okay, so he's saying that, you know, government can create this money. The government yeah. is the only one that can create this money. Now, yeah. to me, the idea of creating money to pay for a debt is kind of like saying, well, I don't have enough money to cover my expenses, so what I will do is I will just write myself a check. <laughs> well, I wish I could do that. For what I need. Head and, to the bank right now. And that'll create the money that I need yeah. to cover my expenses. I, and, and it's essentially the same thing. But it, what he's saying here is that only the government can do this, really. Yeah. And he's he's conflating money and currency. So the government does create currency, but the government doesn't create money. I mean, this yeah. guy wasn't paying attention to J.P. J. Morgan when he... Um, testified in front of the legislator and said um, money is gold and nothing else. Yeah. Now, it doesn't actually... I, I'm, I, I can't sign on to it's only gold, but yeah. money... It has to have a value yeah. beyond what what it physical... Well, it has to have a physical value. It has value. to have intrinsic value. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah exactly. uh, a perceived value, anyway. Yeah. I mean... Um, well, gold's the, valuable because you can use gold to do stuff. Right. You can make jewelry with it. You can... Well, I mean, that's partially true, but it's been valued throughout history. Well, yeah. Gold is it's, just... It's I just mean, there's a, a lot of reasons that gold particularly is really good. I mean, it doesn't yeah. tarnish. It's easy to work. There's, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of things about it. It's shiny. We all like well, shiny yeah. stuff, you know. Um, but uh, what money really is, is it, it is some kind of commodity that everyone sees value in. Or at least it, it's a commodity that can be used as a medium of exchange. Yeah. Essentially, it's a, it's just another part of the barter system. But instead of having to find somebody that has exactly what you need and wants exactly what you have to give, you can use this this medium, this in between stored, commodity, stored value. Yes and no. I mean, it's it's just got to be a commodity that you can use both to um, to. That you see enough value in that you can trade for something else. Yeah. It, it's essentially just an in-between trade, but it's something that everybody accepts. But it's That's still, really what money is. It's still a store of value. Though. Well, you want it to be a store of value. Well, I mean, it should be. Or it, if it's not, it's not a good currency. I mean, the, there were places where they used calorie shells for money. They're not really yeah. a store of value. Yeah. Um, at least not as we see it now. I mean, they certainly yeah. felt like it at the time, but it was something that everybody had saw value in yeah and so that it was something that you could use as a medium of, ex of exchange between other goods yeah um so that's re that's really what the money is but the point is that it has to be tied to something that has value of its own um it, it has to be tied to something with value and currency used to be yeah. I, I mean you know there is a law in this country that only the government can mint coinage etc it's a, yeah. only the government can create currency in this country legally but what currency was originally, and it's not so much anymore, but we'll get to yeah. that. Yeah. What currency was, was originally was just a, a, like a promissory note for a commodity. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the reason when you have your old bills, they'll say silver certificate. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, uh, uh, there was a time when you could take that currency to the bank and get an X amount of gold for it or silver or whatever the commodity mm -hmm. was. I, Cause I think they right. used a couple. I mean, I know the gold standards, what you always hear about. Yeah. And it was just a, it was a matter of convenience really yeah. because gold's kind of heavy. Yeah. I mean, like if you were buying something really big, um, then you didn't want to carry around all that gold. Yeah. And so what you could do is it, like currency was essentially an IOU. So yep. that you could give the person, there was a bank that collected the the actual valuable good, the gold, yeah. and they gave you promissory notes essentially that said this is worth X amount of gold, and you could exchange those to somebody else, and they could go to the bank and trade it in for the actual valuable commodity yeah. if they <clears throat> so saw fit. Yeah, yeah, and um, and so that's where currency started. But we disconnected from the gold standard in 1973. I was going to say, it was in the 70s. I'm not sure. Of yeah, it was the under year. Nixon, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, there, there is no connection to any real commodity anymore. Our, yeah. our money is only valuable because somebody says so. Well, and that's really when you start, when, you, when people talk about the, the problem with wages now, that's really where that, time, where that started, was in the 70s. Yeah. Well, and. Um, there's a big difference in the 
level of inflation when the money when the currency was still connected to a commodity yeah. as opposed to now yeah. um and i can't remember the exact numbers but uh i was reading through uh some stuff that was saying that um essentially that the uh like the British pound, that it's the inflation rate had remained relatively low over centuries while it was connected to, um, I think the pound was it's sterling silver. Anyway. Bring on the pounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it was connected to the commodity. And when, the, when they disconnected it from the commodity, that the inflation ran rampant, essentially. That yeah. uh, the pound is like a third or a quarter of the value that it was before and it only lost like 3% of its value in the previous century or something like that. I mean, you know, so there's clearly a connection here. Yeah. And, and the reason that it lost value probably is discovery of more gold or silver or what have you. I mean, the, um, the, you know, you, you can increase the money supply by finding more of the valuable good and extracting it. Yeah. And that's the hard part. Now it takes an investment to do that too. And if, and this is one of those wonderful things about the market. I mean, this is definitely a supply and demand thing. It's difficult and it costs money to extract gold from the earth. Yeah. Okay. We'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll start there. Right? Yeah. It's difficult and it costs money to extract gold from the earth. Well, if gold's not worth very much, it's not worth doing it. Yeah. But as more and more people are using gold and, and gold's getting exchanged and there are more and more people on the earth and there's more transactions going on and then there starts to be a, a bit of a scarcity of that gold, not enough to go around for everybody to trade and barter for what they need, uh, then the value of that gold starts to go up and up and up. And it reaches a certain point where it suddenly becomes worthwhile <clears throat> to spend that money to extract the gold. and From hard and, to get places. Yeah, and, and move it into circulation. And then if you move enough of it into the circulation, the value starts to drop again, and then it's not worth it anymore, and you wait again until... Well, and we see the same thing with oil prices. Oil prices do Absolutely. the same thing. And um, fracking, actually, is an area where that's that's very common. Like, you hit a point where it's worth it to go through the trouble of getting that oil through the fracking process. Yeah, it's somewhere between 50 and $60 a barrel, I think. Yeah. I'm not an expert on it for sure, but, mm-hmm. but I do know that that's how that works. And then once it hits that point, all of a sudden, or once it goes below that point, I guess, it's not worth it anymore. So right. then you quit. Fracking goes ceases to be a thing anymore. Yeah, we saw that recently when gold value... or. Now I'm back on gold again. Um, when the oil values uh, went up to almost eighty dollars a barrel, yeah, uh, not that long ago, um, there was a whole bunch of production that that went into effect really quickly. Now there's also a bunch of countries that kind of hoard their oil when the value is low, yeah, and then when the price goes up, they they release, they release it into the it. market. And that, um, so we're now running at like fifty to fifty-five dollars a barrel, I think. Yeah. Um. So it's like right on that cusp of where fracking is. Is Feasible. worthwhile, yeah. But uh, anyway, I mean, but that's the that's the big thing here is that he he seems to think that money and currency are the same thing, yeah. and they're not. Currency is a rep- a representation of money, but money is connected to a commodity. Money yeah. money is something that actually has value. Yeah, it's not just a piece of paper that's signed by the treasurer and the treasury secretary. Yeah, and uh. You know, just making more of it does not answer all our problems. No. Yeah. It, believe me, it only creates more. I mean, so. Um, I mean, he also complains about the boom-bust cycle, which, you know, the Austrian economists that that I read have connected solely to government intervention, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's some mild uh, cycles in economies, but... It's connected mostly to control of uh, interest rates that the Fed does um, because, you know, I mean, I think we could even take it for granted that uh, businesses invest in long-term build-up, you know, expansion when interest rates are low. Yeah. Because for obvious reasons, I would say, but we'll explain it just in case. Um, that uh, when interest rates are low, they can borrow a bunch of money uh, for long-term plans and not have to spend as much. Yeah. When interest rates are high, you have to spend a lot of money to borrow that money 
to do those long-term plans. So if you're when you're looking at, at the relative value, you're saying, well, how quickly can I make my money back yeah. after I've built whatever it is that I want What's to build? What's it going to take to flip this? Yeah, so when interest rates are low, it takes less time to get your money back, your investment yeah. money back. Yeah. Um, so uh, when you have a situation here, and in a free market, the interest rates would be driven by um, savings and and well, how um, much money is borrowing. in the bank, right? Like how much yeah, mo- well, how much money the bank has. So the more people that are saving money, mm-hmm. the more money would be in the bank to make the rates lower, right? And vice versa. Yeah, and the interest rate controls all that. We, you know, so each individual bank would have its own rate, mm-hmm. and it would be competitive because yeah. the you know if you're uh, paying five percent interest, but the bank down the road is paying five and a quarter. Then, where am I going? <laughs> yeah, where am I going to go save my money? Yeah. Um, and and then as the the interest rates increase, more and more people put money in. But the way a bank makes money is by offering an interest rate to people to save, and then charging a slightly higher interest rate to people to, to borrow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so you know, if they end up with too much money in the bank and not enough people wanting to borrow then the interest rates start to drop. Yeah. So then that discourages saving and encourages borrowing. Mm. And then when they have the opposite problem, then they increase interest rates. So it discourages borrowing and encourages saving. Exactly. Um, I mean, this is how it would normally go. But the way it works right now <laughs> is that the Federal Reserve defines the interest rate, Yeah. Um, essentially. Now, it's bank to bank is what they're actually defining, but it affects all the the interest rates that are offered to people and so forth. Yeah. And we've been at near zero interest I was rates say, for a long time. We are time. artificially low in a in a bad way. Mm-hmm. I mean it's it's really, really low. And there's like I say, and that's the whole here's the fear though. So they're artificially low so that we can spur the economy. But what ha- we're we're close to another recession. Whether or not we're gonna see it within this this political cycle or not, I don't know. But what's going to happen when we have that downturn now? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nowhere else to take the rates. They can't get any lower than what they are. Well, what's really interesting about it is that that those low rates are what really are going to is going to cause the recession. Agree. Um, oh, that's I'd... what that's what builds the bubble. Yeah, you have a whole bunch of people investing when they shouldn't be. Yeah, but they think that they should because businesses use those interest but, rates as a it's an interest it's an rate indicator. is essentially the cost of money. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's an indicator of, of where we're at. And so they're expanding um, to uh, create more and more consumer goods yeah. or, you know, what, it, what generates money, generates revenue for them. Yeah. So they're expanding because there's these low interest rates. And so that's a, a sign, actually, that people are, are saving too much. Yeah. That there's a lot of people saving, and so there's money out there to get, and so they expand their production, and there's going to be a market for that. Yeah, but that's not the but case. But the reality is that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're not only nationally are we are we more in debt than we've been in who oh, knows man. how long, but the private debt is greater than it's been. Well, maybe, ever. and that's why all the all the signs for us to to print money the way this guy's talking about are kind of there. There's really, there's a lot of people that can gain from for some, from some serious inflation right now mm-hmm. because you can inflate that. Not only can the government inflate their debt away, the individuals that have made bad decisions can inflate their, their debt away too. Well, and but, unfortunately at this point, we're $22 trillion sovereign debt. Yeah, we ain't inflating that away. Not well, in, that's the only way to get rid of it. Well, that is the only way to get rid of it. That's I mean, the it's only the only way to get rid of it. Yeah. I guess that's true. I hadn't really looked at it that way. I mean, because yeah, I, I, sorry um, to interrupt you, but I listened back through uh, to the last podcast we did, and you told me that um, Bernie Sanders had entered the race. Oh, he was making he made four million dollars in donations in the first day, and I said um, it would take uh, you know five thousand uh, more days than for him to pay off the national debt. Yeah. Well, I was off by three orders of magnitude when I listened back through that. I was like, what was I thinking? Because 5,000 times 4 million is only 20 billion. Oh, really? Our debt is 20 trillion. Yeah. So he would need 5 million more days to pay off the debt, assuming that the, the debt didn't get any bigger. Yeah. So we're looking at, 
like I, I finally I did the math. It's more than fifteen thousand years <laughs> making four million dollars a day. Wow! Before we could pay off the debt, four million dollars a day. It would take a day. It would take fifteen thousand years to pay off our current national it's, debt. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around how much money that actually is. So Bernie definitely be dead by the time. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can, we <laughs> yeah, so we can safely say that, that he ain't paying it all. Right. <laughs> Uh, and it really begs the question of how else do you, other than inflating it? I mean, uh, and it's the only answer. Yeah, it's the only answer at this yeah. point. Um, so, a, another financial crisis is unavoidable. We have gone too deep into this, and you know, there's no other, there's no other option. And this guy, well, he has an answer for how we'll pay for this. Yeah. And I saw something that suggested that the. Uh, the Green New Deal would cost us something like $93 trillion oh, dollars over the next 10 years. When I'm telling you, when you read through that thing, there is just, yeah, I mean, there, it's unimaginable how much money that would cost. Like, yeah. I mean, you start proposing all, because there's so many things that are just, like, proposed. Like, we should mm. do this, yeah, and we like, should do sure. that. <laughs> the, the thing that really bothers me about it, from what I've seen, and I, I didn't read through the whole thing like you did. Uh, let me mention though that the, the, while this guy has an answer for how we'll how to pay, pay for, for it, it, yeah, he doesn't address debt at all. I mean, really? like, we were talking about debt here. We we're already twenty two trillion dollars in debt. This thing would cost ninety three trillion dollars, four times as much as our debt already is. Good night. Over the next ten years, like you know, okay, fine. Where'd the money come from? Well, we'll just print it. We'll print it. Yeah. Whatever. But it. It assumes that there's no concern about an actual debt. Like, that that yeah. does not matter. Yeah. And it does. And it's, it's um, for us, I mean, you know, we're opposed to this kind of spending anyway by a government. But yeah. um, if you think about it in terms of, like, the tax cuts this last year, it just, there, there weren't corresponding spending cuts. Um, so it just increased our deficit and, and therefore increased our debt. Yep. And so, you know, we don't, we're opposed to taxation, but there's a problem with this anyway. Yeah. And I, I don't think that I can get on board with the tax cuts without corresponding spending cuts. And this is the reason why is because worse than taxation, I, I think is wealth redistribution. Yeah. Like wealth redistribution I have a real problem with because it, it I mean taxation is theft in and of itself. Yeah. But like no matter what you're doing with the money, you know, it it's still like any kind of wealth redistribution is theft from one person that you think doesn't deserve it. And this is kind of arbitrary as far as I can tell. To be given to somebody that you think does deserve it still arbitrary yeah all right so it's you know rob from the rich and and feed the poor or whatever that's not really how it works i i think this whole thing is kind of arbitrary and you're taking f money from people mostly who have earned this money yeah. and giving it to people who haven't yeah. and and this is a problem but anytime you're building additional debt it's still a wealth redistribution but it's longitudinal yeah right so you're taking money from people in the future to pay the people now. Yeah. Which means our grandkids and great can grandkids. And yes. Yeah, as Somebody's far down the line as, yeah, as far down the line as you can see, we're mm -hmm. paying for this. Like there's no real, no, no real end in sight. Yeah. You tax it, you spend it or you borrow it. That's the only way the government can create money. Yeah. That, that's the only way it like, you, Sorry, you tax it, you print it, you borrow it. Yeah, that's the I was, only way. I'll fix that. They <laughs> they, yeah. they spend it all the time. All of yeah. those get spent. Yeah, all of those. Yeah, we're not yeah. we're not printing it to not spend it. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> Absolutely, as this guy so clearly yeah, lays explained. out for us. Um, so uh, you know the it, it's still a problem because you what you're doing is you're taking away money from the future to to pay the present. Yeah. Um. So inflation, though, you know, if they're really concerned about uh, the lower classes and the underprivileged and whatever. Yeah, what? Um, then inflation actually really is a problem. He says it's not a thing, mm -hmm. but inflation advantages the people at the top and disadvantages the people at the bottom. Yeah. And he's one of those people at the top, by the way, because his one of his jobs is he's 
a senior counsel at Westwood Capital. He's primarily law stuff, but uh, a socially responsible investment bank in Midtown Manhattan. Oh, well, that makes it better. I don't know much about him, but I, I know that the left really hates those bankers. Yeah. So I'm not sure why this guy's you know, really on board with this whole thing. Actually, I do know why he's really on board with this whole thing. It's because inflation benefits him. He gets mm-hmm. to use the money, the the government, the bankers, the, the places where the money is funneled when it's created. Yeah. Um, because it's funneled through, through the banks. Um, and, you know, so government and the banks get to spend the money first. Well, the government and the banks spend the money when it's new. It still has the same value as it did before. Yeah. By the time it trickles down to, you know, people like you and me, us poor schlubs, the plebes at the bottom, All right. um, that money has lost its value because inflation has kicked in. Yeah. So when they print, you know, when they double the money supply, let's just assume that this was all relative, right? So if you double the money supply, then, then the dollar was worth half as much. Well, the dollar's not worth half as much right from the beginning. Yeah. Because not everybody knows that all that money is out there in the economy. That's an interesting way to look at it. I had never considered that. That You're right, though. When when it's initially inputted into the economy, mm-hmm. like it's you're right. There, those, That's new money. So it's not affected by what it's fixing to do to the economy. Right. It's, you know, the difference between the day before. Yeah. It's the same value as it was the day before. But yeah. day thousand... Or yeah. whatever, you know, well, talk once, a couple once it, of years in. Once it yeah. started to, to move around the economy. It's made its effect on it. It's, yeah. it's started to, to bleed down the, the value. When it gets into the hands of the real consumers like us, yeah, it doesn't have the same value it did when it was first input. Yeah. When it was first created. So, um, you know, he's, he's essentially advocating helping... The higher classes like himself. Yeah. So I can see why he's on board with this whole thing. I I really like the his conclusion though. All right. Um. I, this is one of those little tricks of of uh, rhetoric, I suppose. And I probably use it too. I, I don't intentionally, so I apologize. <laughs> but. It's one of those things where he said he talks about how brilliant the people that agree with him are, and how stupid the people that aren't. <laughs> yeah, gotta love that though. That, yeah. yeah. So this is his conclusion. He says, "Have I convinced you both that there isn't a pay for challenge, and that there isn't, thanks to a multitude of theoretical, empirical, and policy lever reasons, an inflation challenge either? If you are bold, no finance, and care about our future." You probably didn't need much convincing. If instead you were frightened, financially untutored, or cavalier about our economy or our planet, please buck up, wise up, and suit up. It is time to say game on for the Green New Deal. Are you convinced? Yeah. I can't say I am. All on board. I mean, (laughs) I read the Green New Deal, so I can't say I'm convinced by any of it. It was really just a whole bunch of gibberish like it's just a whole bunch of it, there's really no substance in there at all like there's there there's no real plan anything like that it's it's just a bunch of crazy ideas i keep thinking about maybe this is the place to to end you talked about maybe ending on a quote from now on and i may not have this quote exactly right but i keep thinking about this cuz i i watched it again recently um I don't know if you're a big Simpsons fan or not. I'm, I'm, I'm a, just, just a little. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Simpsons fan. I used to watch that constantly. In fact, I proposed at one point an all Simpsons all the time channel. Dude, that channel would rake it in, man. I think and, it would. Too. <laughs> and there's so many episodes at yeah, this point it's been that running it for could just, just cycle and cycle. Years almost. Oh 1990 man. 1990 is when yeah. it started. But anyway, there's, <laughs> there's an episode. Um, it's, I don't remember what the episode's called, but it's a little Lisa slurry. Anybody that's a Simpsons fan is going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, but there's this part where, where Lisa challenges Mr. Burns about recycling. He doesn't even know what recycling is, but she talks about, you know, the, the to try and save n- nature or save the planet, something like that. And, <laughs> and he says, Oh, mother nature needs a hand. Does she? Well, she should have thought of that while she was sending floods and droughts and poison monkeys our way. 
Nature started the fight for survival, and now she wants to quit because she's losing. <laughs> well, I say hard cheese. Ooh, love it. <laughs> so, with that, yes, I guess we'll call it a night. Call and it say, a uh, you know, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get it right next time. So, ciao. Later.